Are you looking for AWS interview questions? If so, this video is for you. Hi, my name is Michael Gibbs and I'm the founder and CEO of Go Cloud Architects and we're an organization dedicated towards building high performance cloud computing careers. Today we're going to be talking about AWS interview questions. Now, at Go Cloud Architects, we spend a lot of time teaching you how to interview. And we teach you the leadership skills, we teach you the verbal skills, and we teach you the interview skills. But that's for your generic interviews. But there's still a technical interview for the Cloud Architect. And the point of the technical interview is to ascertain what your level of technical competency is, but also determine how well you can explain the technology, how well you understand the technology, and if you can design the technology. So let's help you out. Let's give you some more Cloud Architect questions so you can learn from the questions, be prepared for your interview, and get hired. Since the ultimate goal of all this training is to have you have a fantastic Cloud Architect career. The first question we're going to ask you today is what is a load balancer and why would you use it? So really what we're trying to determine is not if you know the name of an AWS service or a Google service, that's not important from an architecture perspective. What is important is that you know what a load balancer is and why you would use it. So let's talk about first, what is a load balancer? A load balancer is a type of device, it's typically a server or a piece of specific hardware that will determine which server to send traffic to. So if you desire to load share between five servers, you're going to use a load balancer to share the load across from five servers. So why would we do all this? Why wouldn't we just use a big server? Well, in reality, you could in many cases just use a really big server as opposed to five small servers, but you've got a problem. What if the single server fails? You've got nothing. You've got no redundancy. So when you're designing a high performance web application that also requires high availability, you're going to use a load balancer. So a load balancer is a device to increase the availability and performance of your systems. That's what a load balancer is and that's really what you need to know. Now, when we look at load balancers, we can further break them down into either network load balancers or application load balancers and they're a little bit different. Network load balancers are really fast. Network load balancers work at layer four. So basically they're looking at say what's going on in the TCP header and they're pushing it across the other side. And they're very fast because all they're looking at is layer four information. And all they're looking at is layer four information. So they're really fast. They don't have a lot to do. So when you're using a load balancer and you need extreme performance, you're going to use a network load balancer. The other type of load balancer is something called an application load balancer. And an application load balancer works instead of layer four of the OSI model, like the network load balancer, at layer seven of the OSI model. And an application load balancer looks at the application. So if you need an incredible amount of application intelligence and application routing, you're going to use an application load balancer because it can look in things of say the TCP header, I'm sorry, the HTTP header, and it can do very detailed routing based upon what's going on. So application load balancer, if you're going to say route between microservices or you need intelligence in your routing, network load balancer if you need speed. Now, of course, when you deal with AWS or GCP, they have their version of an elastic load balancer for network and elastic load balancer for application. But realistically speaking, it's just a network or application load balancer. In your architecture, you need to know what to use, which is going to be a network load balancer, an application load balancer. And then on the cloud provider, you can pick the service that matches it. The next question I'm going to ask you is, what is a firewall? And the reason we ask this is a firewall is an absolutely critical component to security but when we ask people questions, we find that many just don't know. So let's talk about it. A firewall protects the perimeter of the edge of your network. It is a security appliance that's basically standing guard saying you're not allowed in, you're not allowed in, you're not allowed in. And what a firewall does is it looks for traffic based upon policy. Firewalls by default will block all external traffic from coming in. They want to come in, it's blocked, 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 blocked. Because unless you allow it in, the firewall will block everything. By comparison, a firewall will allow all your internal network out on the internet and it will allow all your return, your return traffic back through the firewall. How? Firewalls are what's called stateful. What we mean by stateful is stateful actually tracks what's going on. So if I'm behind the firewall and I am behind the firewall while I'm making this video, if I want to send my traffic to the internet, 
I send my traffic through the firewall. Now my firewall smart, it's stateful. It's watching and it says, okay, Mike started the session, let his return traffic come back because I know it's destined for Mike and I know it's related to the same session where Mike requested the web content because it's stateful, so it's watching you. So what does the firewall do? It blocks traffic the edge of your network, it keeps your network secure, it blocks all traffic denied by policy and it miraculously lets your outbound traffic back if it's coming from you. So that is the firewall, how it works, and you would use it to enhance security. The next question, and we're starting to get into the financial implications of cloud computing. So the question is, how does cloud computing affect an organization's cost? Well, it affects it a lot in a lot of different ways. So let's first look at it from the first perspective of, cloud, of normal cost. Typically in a data center, you have a large amount of capital cost. You're purchasing servers, you're purchasing networks, you're purchasing all the devices that go on servers, workstations, firewalls, load balancers, routers, switches, air conditioning, power distribution units, those are the things that you must purchase, which means capital. And it costs something to maintain this data, and that's called your operational costs. So in a traditional data center, you have extremely high capital costs, and your operational costs are related to things like electric, your network connections, and the people that staff your network. So typically speaking, super high capital costs, moderately high. Um, ongoing costs. Now when you move to the cloud, there's nothing to buy. So when since there's nothing to buy, the shift to the cloud substantially decreases your capital expenditures or your capital costs. But every time you do anything on the cloud, you're gonna pay for it. You're gonna pay for data being sent, you're gonna pay for every second your systems are up, you're gonna pay for every day that your network connections are up, and you're gonna pay for data sent on your network. So in a cloud computing environment, while capital costs are really low, your operational costs are extremely high. So the cloud computing environment causes a shift from capital expenses effectively to operational expenses. So in a cloud computing environment, it is much more expensive operationally, but much cheaper capital-wise. Is it cheaper on the cloud? It may be, it may not be, and that's gonna be based upon how well the architecture is done, how well it's planned, and whether there really is a benefit for, for this customer. But what there will always be is an agility benefit. Meaning if it took me a month to buy a server from Dell and have it delivered and installed, and I can spin up an EC2 instance, for example, on the AWS cloud in seconds, that level of agility is incredible. And that level of agility is one of the main reasons to move to the cloud speed, agility. The next question we're gonna ask you today are what are VPC flow logs and why you would use them? Now this is a bit of a networking slash AWS question. And the reason we're asking it is we wanna see if you understand traffic flows and traffic management and why you would use them. So for people from the networking world, they're pretty familiar with something called Cisco NetFlow. And what Cisco NetFlow did is it would examine the traffic that would cross Cisco routers and you could say, hmm, the traffic's all going from here to point B. And the reason you were doing this is you were looking for security violations, you were looking for areas of congestion in your network, and it would enable you to better plan what's going on in your network and troubleshoot. Fantastic. So AWS did the same thing. They created something called the flow log, and the flow log basically lets you see the traffic that goes across your VPC. VPC flow logs give you lots of information about your traffic flows, but they are excellent from troubleshooting, especially in security. For example, the VPC flow logs will tell you like the source and destination. It will tell you the protocols and the port numbers of things going on the wire. And for example, you can see that something's being accepted by your ACL, but rejected by the security group. And if you've got traffic that's supposed to go to a web server and it's accepted by the ACL, but blocked by the security group and you want it there, now you know what to fix. So VPC flow logs give you a lot of information about your traffic and they help you set up your proper flows and they help you debug things when things are broken. So they're very effective in the troubleshooting environment. Now this next question is an architecture question and you have a web server in a data center and you want to move it to the cloud. What do you need to know before you move it to the cloud? Server in the data center, you want to bring it to the cloud. What do you need to know? Well, I'll tell you. First thing we need to know is the power of the server. How many cores, how much DRAM, how much storage, because guess what? We need the same thing for the cloud. We need a virtual machine that's gonna have a similar number of cores, a similar amount of DRAM, and provide the appropriate storage. So in this particular environment, just lift a server to the cloud, just know the basics of your virtual machine or your server on one end, match it up with an instance, which is a virtual machine on the other end, and there you go, completely done. 
Now I'm going to give you one more question for the day, and this question is the difference with regard is a, is a DNS question, and what is the difference between latency-based routing and geolocation-based routing? Now, what we're looking for, because you could think of both of these as latency-based, but in some ways they are, but in some ways they're not. Latency-based routing determines the lowest latency and sends you to the web server with the lowest latency, so you get the best experience. Geolocation routing is something different. Geolocation routing actually looks at the source IP address and determines what's closest to you. So let's say, for example, I'm in Canada, and I know that this province is French and this province is English. I might look at the user's source address and say, route the French province to the French website, route the English province to the English website. So that's when you would use geolocation routing. Geolocation routing enables you to take users based upon their source address and send them to a different destination. So it's great when you're dealing with a multinational company for which they have multiple languages and they need multiple websites. Latency routing is for speed and performance. Geolocation routing, while it will also optimize speed and performance, what it really will do will send people to the appropriate website based upon their locations. So what did we talked about today? We talked about what a load balancer was, what a firewall was, how does cloud computing affect an organization's cost, what are VPC flow logs and why would you use them? How to do a simple lift and shift of a server from the data center to the cloud. And we talked about the difference between latency-based routing and geolocation routing. Let's talk about some things that we can do to help you in your cloud computing career. Every Monday and every Thursday, we have a free how to get your first cloud job webinar. And on this webinar, we teach you everything you need to know to get your first job, things that could be on your resume, um, how to be the perfect uh, interview, um, exactly what hiring managers are look for, looking for, and the types of certifications that you need. And then after that, we spend an hour answering any cloud architect career questions you may have. We do this for free on Mondays and Thursdays. Now on every Tuesday, what we do is we have a cloud architect experience webinar. And on this webinar, we talk about it from a technology perspective. What is it going to take to get the real world experience of a cloud architect so you can get hired? So on Mondays, we do how do you build your career, and on Tuesdays, we talk about technology, and it's all free. Now, most Wednesdays, not all, but most Wednesdays, we hold a free YouTube Live where you can bring us any Cloud Architect career question, and we will answer them live in real time. Um, typically, we do these. We get lots of people. It's typically a fun experience. We love to coach the world, and we do it completely for free. We do it mostly, so please subscribe to our channel and check out. We have just instituted the Ask Cloud Mike email address program. I'll drop the link in the description below. If you have any questions about your cloud computing career and you can't make it to one of the free webinars, send us an email to Ask Cloud Mike. The link is in the description below. Ask a question related to your career and we will do everything we can to try and produce a video on our YouTube channel to answer your questions, especially if you don't live in a time zone where you can attend one of our free webinars. A few more things that we have. We provide a free AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate eBook. The link is in the description below. And if you're working on the AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate, we also have a completely free AWS Certified Solution Architect training program. I'll leave the link in the description below. Our team is currently authoring an AWS Advanced Security and an AWS Advanced Networking eBook, and they're going to be released in approximately eight weeks. I'll leave the links in the description below. You can pre-register and they will be delivered to you via email completely free when they are released. Thank you so much for allowing me to be part of your career with, uh, by, by watching these videos. It's an honor and a privilege to be part of this Cloud Architect community. I've been in technology now for 25 years and I absolutely love this community. So thank you for the, the privilege to be able to work with you all. I look forward to seeing you in another video next week. Take care, talk, talk to you soon.